How do you work on a boat geothermal unit? Today we're going to be working on a boat's air conditioning system. We got a blank thermostat. You're watching HVAC Tips for Technicians. I'm Tad. Let's get started. All right, thermostat is blank. Take it off the wall. No batteries. R and C. Check power. Just check power between R and C. No voltage. All right, open this door here. And now we can get to the geo unit. All right. Here's the pump for this geo unit. There's the geo unit right there. There's not a lot of room in here. Here's the filter. Gotta have a filter. This is a pump and dump system. So this pipe right here, it brings the water in from beneath the boat. Gotta have a check valve. And then we got shut off valve union for taking the filter loose and union on the other side for taking the pump loose. Got to have unions and that is one inch hose coming into the pump and then one inch hose going out of the pump. So here's the coaxial and I replaced that coaxial. Anytime you got a big pressure drop across a coaxial, it means or it's an indication that it could mean that the coaxial stopped up. Sometimes you can wash them out, and sometimes you can't. It really depends on the buildup and you know what the application is. So there is where it pumps the water out. All right. So real quick, pumps the water in. All right, into the pump, and then it goes into the coaxial, and then it pumps the water out. And then dumps it right outside so I took the panel off this is a Florida heat pump and then there's the controls we got to use our meter find out what's going on here's the compressor section I got a feeling it's probably a transformer or a fuse right here it says model number GT 048 so it's a four ton unit you can see there's the ductwork right there return and supply all right let's go first thing we want to check meter on volts ac check power coming in line side of the contactor 239 volts let's go up here to the terminal block where it says r and c let's check from r to c it's hard to see it but got the meter leads no voltage. All right, now let's check the power going to the transformer and then from the transformer. So on the primary side, we should have 240 volt. And then on the secondary, we should have 24. So primary wires is black, red, or orange. We're gonna use black and orange. I'm sure that's what's used. So black and orange, you should have 240 volts. Secondary, we've got, hard to see, blue and yellow so it should have, we should have 24 so let me trace these wires the orange and black go into these wire nuts and then these wires go to different connections so i can check right here to check the power to the transformer i'm going to do that first all right checking those connections we got 230 volt going to the transformer that's the primary side let's check the secondary the yellow and the blue are the secondary. It looks like the yellow goes to the R terminal and the blue goes to the C terminal. We've already checked that. So there is no inline fuse. The transformer is bad. You got power going in, no power going out. Now I'm gonna check for uh, areas where we could have a low voltage short that can cause this because I don't wanna put in the new transformer and then have an issue. So checking in this section oh we got some wires that are touching right here okay so those wires were touching those goes to the that goes to the pressure switch high pressure switch on the discharge line of the compressor so let me see if I can find oh yeah oh dude that was bare that's bare wire that's an easy find right there, easy fix. Isolate, uh, tape this with some rubber tape and then wire tie it. 
We'll check some more wires, but I was gonna check the contactor coil, ohm it out, and then of course check, you know, why it's touching copper, but I think we already found it. Wow, that's awesome. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and take the transformer out, replace it, put a fuse in line with the R. Make sure you turn the breaker off before you remove the transformer. I've got the transformer removed. I'm gonna do a little inspection on it, and then I'm gonna install the new transformer. Breaker box is over there, and there's another access over there, so I'm gonna go get to the breaker box. Here's how you get out of the hole when you're ready. There's not a lot of room in here. Ah. <laughs> Air handler, 30. All right, that should be it. Checking the power. Still got power. There we go, I got it. Killed everything good. Now we don't have power, awesome. All right, all right, before we mount the transformer, figure out which wires I'm using. I'm gonna use white and orange. So common and then 240 and then blue and yellow. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and cut the power back on. I got these wires to where I can tape them and secure them. Had to cut a wire tie. There's my fuse in line with the R. Secondary side of the transformer. I'm going to go ahead and tape both of these spades and then reconnect them. But I want to go ahead and turn the power on. Also, all the wires you're not using on your primary side, make sure there's a wire nut on there. I'm going to take all these wires and wire tie them up here like this. Because that's what happened was they got pulled tight and then wire tied right here and they were laying up against that copper piece. So I'm gonna put them right here. No chance of touching anything. All right, got that wire tie in place. Wires are no longer touching. Got the tape here. Now I'm gonna check from R to, it's hard to see, but C. All right, you can't really see that. 26 volts though. We got voltage now. And the transformer is mounted correctly. We've got the gauges hooked up. Now we're going to go ahead and turn thermostat on cooling. Thermostat on cooling. Pump is running. All right. Whenever the contactor closes, it applies power to the compressor and it applies power to the pump and the water pump wire is right here this goes to the water pump so now suction line temperature is 49 degrees got our clamp on the suction line low side is 65 saturation 40 and high, uh, the head pressure is 180 Saturation is hard to see that, but about 63. And there's where we hooked up the gauges. Low side port and then high side port right there. So if we've got 48, 49, and 41, then we've got about, oh no, 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 38. 38 and 49 so or 50 we got about 12 degrees of superheat so that's pretty good this unit is not 410a see r22 one circuit pressures look good i think we fixed the issue for today doors back on tools back in my bag let's get out of here and here is the outlet pipe. You can see the water coming out the side of the boat. That is cool. This right here is the power for these boats. That's where the power comes from and goes to the boat. If you need help learning more about geothermal, I've got a video on my members only playlist titled Geothermal Training. Go check it out. If you haven't received my geothermal training guide and you're a level one member, 
contact me through my email. If you don't have my email, comment below, let me know. If you're a member, I'll get you my email and I'll get that guide to you. If you enjoyed the video, if you learned something, let me know in the comments what it was. If you liked the video, hit the like button, subscribe, smash that bell, ding, so you know what I'm doing. You've been watching HVAC Tips for Technicians. I'm Tad and I'll keep you cool if you let me. If you're here after the video, I'm giving you some bonus geothermal info for those of you who really want to learn more. So working on geothermal units on boats is a lot more difficult than working on a geothermal unit at a house. And that's because there's not a lot of room to work on the unit. So if you like your knees, then you will not like working on geo units on boats. Your knees are going to hurt when you get done. That being said, if you have experience and knowledge enough to, to work on a geo unit and you want to work on a geo unit on a boat, you may need to think about upping your service charge and your hourly labor rate for working on a geo unit on a boat. For instance, if you have a service call rate of $100, maybe make it $200. And then for your hourly rate, if it's $50 an hour, maybe make it $100 an hour. This will make you more money and make the job more worth going to do because it is not fun working on these units and I only work on a, a few boats and that's for a few customers that I like. If I don't like the customer, I'm not working on your boat and I'm not working on their boat and if it's a good setup, I'll work on it but other than that, it just it really comes down to if I like the customer. Okay, so geothermal units on boats are open loop systems. That means they pump the water into the geo unit and pump the water out. As you can see in this video, you can see the water coming out the side of the boat towards the bottom. For open loop systems, you're either pulling from a river or you're pulling from some water source like a well. Most open loop type geothermal systems I work on for residential homes, they're mostly closed loop. And that means the water is in a closed loop and it circulates back and forth. Closed loop pipe configurations are vertical, horizontal, there are two pipe and four pipe systems, there are slinky loop, and I have customers that have ponds, and if they want to use the pond, they'll take and do a slinky loop, which is just rolled up pipe, HDPE, and they'll just put it inside the pond, and then they'll get something to weigh it down, that way it stays at the, towards the bottom, uh, in case the water dries up in the pond, because you want water covering the uh, pipes. So there's a few different types of configurations. Again, for open loop, where you're pumping and dumping, if you're pumping from the river into the geo and back out, that's one open loop system. And then for houses, it's usually pumping from the well into the system and then outside. So I've worked on several of those. If you want more videos where I'm working on geo units, go check out my playlist, HVAC Tips for Technicians. I've probably got at least 10 videos of working on geo units and fixing different problems. Now, what kind of problems can you have with geo units? Well, the pumps will build up with scale and the pumps will go bad. And sometimes you just can change the motor. You don't have to actually change the impeller. Uh, most geo systems have a flow center with two pumps, uh, but some geo systems just have one pump like you, the one you saw on that geo unit for the boat. Uh, for geo units, you can have coaxials that start to leak and when they leak, then you can have water go inside the system and they can ruin the compressor. And that's a situation where you may need to get a new geo unit. You can also have coaxials that get stopped up. And if you wanna learn more about cleaning them, I would check out Google and just type in how to clean a coaxial on a geo unit or consult some of these manufacturers like Water Furnace. Sometimes you have to replace those coaxials. Even though geothermal units last longer than regular air conditioning systems, you still have components that go bad. I've replaced a lot of indoor coils on geothermal units that were leaking, and I've got videos about that. I've replaced one reversing valve on a geothermal unit, and that was not a typical repair or a typical part that goes bad on a geo unit. I've replaced capacitors where the capacitors went bad and the compressor was no longer starting. I've had geothermal units where there was not enough water pressure. Typically, I like to see at least 30 PSI on the loop as far as water pressure. And I've been to jobs where there's no pressure. There's zero pressure. 
I've had geothermal units where the water pressure was zero and I found out that the pipes were leaking. So a temporary fix to get the customer back up and running was I took the water supply to the house and I ran it to the, uh, the flow center. I ran it into the loop. That way they had water pressure and I also put on a water reducing valve. That way I could set a certain pressure and they could have water. So I've had several things go bad with geo units. I've also had indoor fan motors. Now, indoor fan motors that were um, variable speed and those variable speed motors go bad. I've had several problems. So they do last a lot longer. They are very efficient, but they do still have problems. You need to make sure that you know how to work on them. And if you don't, go check out my playlist, HVAC Tips for Technicians, so that you can learn more. This was just bonus content information for you, and I hope you liked it. Here's the transformer that I used to replace the transformer that was existing. Here's the existing transformer. Used a flathead screwdriver to take off the covers so you can see these copper coils. You can see it's melted. And if you smell it, it smells burnt.